what hour your clock strikes here it's always halloween and i'm always your haunted host luce tomlin brenner welcome to our small frights friday episode each week i like to share a curated selection of calls from the all hollows hotline and letters from the eek mailbag These are all contributions from your fellow listeners, and I love getting to patch together our memories, questions, and experiences to find the commonalities in our shared love of Halloween. Kicking it off today, we have a letter from Brandon, who is writing in response to last week's Small Frights episode in which we discussed Trunk or Treat. Now, many of you know I am I have been staunchly against, or maybe shall I say skeptical of trunk or treat. And that's why I'm so delighted about this email because it made me think about it in a new way. All right, here we go. Hi, Luce. I've been listening to your podcast since the start. I always look forward to the new episode notifications on my smartphone when they pop up. You've done an awesome job with exploring the different topics and subjects about my favorite holiday. I've grown up with Halloween, and every year I always look forward to the start of the fall. I start preparing and planning all my events and haunted houses, and I scout all the stores for Halloween decorations. I've been listening to your podcast, and I had to point out something you mentioned, kind of a different opinion and perspective that was overlooked. I wanted to point out that many mentions about trunk or treating. I've noticed you talk about it being a safety concern for parents to avoid doing trick or treating. However, I will say there's one major detail you left out about who participates in trunk or treat. My wife and I moved into an apartment which is actually on the third floor. Despite our efforts to go all out on decorating our patio with Halloween decorations, We never get any trick-or-treaters. In fact, one year, I brought it up to our apartment complex management's attention. They created a trunk-or-treating event at the front entrance where it was visible to all the trick-or-treaters passing by from neighboring neighborhoods. It was a perfect alternative for those who live in apartments and wanted to hand out candy, like us. We had a ton of people show up with decked-out decorations on their cars. We personally did a fog machine, spooky music, and had all the Halloween lights and decor up. This year, I had an idea. My wife and I are planning on dressing up and visiting the neighborhoods to see the decorations and hand out candy to passerbys. It was a great alternative to experience trick-or-treating as an adult but not be weird and knock on doors asking for candy. It's the best of both worlds. We're looking forward to it. I've heard also of those who tailgate their vehicles in front of other neighbors' houses who have elaborate decorations because they live on a street where it's too dark and kids skip their houses every year. Trunk or treating or tailgating is simply an alternative for those of us who don't have houses to hand out candy. Let me know your thoughts on what you think about going trick or treating as adults, handing out candy, and admiring houses who decorate. Yours truly, Brandon and Christina, have a spooky Halloween. Thank you so much, Brandon and Christina. I hope you also have a spooky Halloween. And I just am so delighted that you made me think about this differently because I got to say, I had a very negative feeling about Trunk or Treat in my gut. It felt like this thing that like hovering helicopter parents were doing that was going to crush Trick or Treat and and turn it into something that was less about neighborhoods and more just about like, I only talk to the people from my church. And that just made me feel sick to my stomach. And so your reframing was so perfect because I I couldn't even imagine another scenario because those were the ones I kept reading articles about. And now I don't hate trunk or tree, at least your version of it. (laughs) I'm still, you know, I'm side-eyeing, side-eyeing people who think it's too dangerous still, but you're right. It's a great alternative. I also live in an apartment. I've always lived in apartments since I moved out of my parents' house and I 
I've never gotten to hand out candy since I moved out of my parents' house. And it's it makes me sad. Like, it's something I desperately wish. It's something I uh, fantasize about even. Um, the idea that I could, like, decorate a front porch and, like, do an elaborate haunted scene for trick-or-treaters. So I applaud your gumption and creativity and... The fact that you were like, hey, apartment management, what can we do about this? Um, So yeah, good for you. That sounds really fun. And I think the idea of kind of going out and being like a a walking trick-or-treat person, like a handing out candy (laughs) is really fun also. And I'm sure the kids that you run into will be really delighted about it. I do like to go out on trick-or-treat night to see decorations and see kids in their costumes, but I haven't thought to hand them candy just as I walk by. So thank you for that really clever idea. Um, Hope that you're staying safe out there and that you guys mask up before you go out. Trick-or-treating was canceled in LA, so I won't be experiencing it in that way this year, but a great idea for next year. Thank you so much. And Thanks again. I love it when my perspective is challenged and I'm able to see something from a new way. And I think it's important not get stuck in our harsh opinions about, uh, you know, moderately trivial aspects of our culture. (laughs) Thanks so much, Brandon. Happy Halloween. Next up, we have a call and this one is a trick or treat memory. Hello, Luce. First off, I love the podcast. It's exactly what I was looking for. Um, I have two questions and two stories. First off, there's a general understanding that you can't trick or treat past a certain age, but that specific age isn't specified, so I figure it must happen differently for everyone. Mine came a little, I think probably a little early. Uh, in 2008, when I was 10 years old, uh, Halo 3 just came out, and I decided I would take up the mantle of candy giver for the first time so I could play Halo all night. Uh, I went trick-or-treating a few times after, but in my 10-year-old brain, it signaled a a real step toward adulthood. So my first question is, when did you and other audience members first not trick-or-treat? Secondly, did you ever reuse a Halloween costume? When I was a kid, I wore the same penguin costume between the ages of probably three to six. Uh, it started off with the sleeves and pants uh, dragging along the ground, and the last time I wore it, they were hiked up super far up my arms and legs, which was a sight to see. Uh, thanks again for the podcast, and as always, happy Halloween. Oh, uh, and uh, I recommend looking at the full moon each night. Or not the full moon, but the moon, cause, because it'll be full. Uh, so it's like a countdown. All right, that's all I got. Bye. Thank you so much for calling in. These are such good questions. I have to say, I'm impressed that you gave up trick-or-treating by the age of 10. Oh my goodness, my mother had to pry my little plastic jack-o'-lantern out of my hand at like 15. (laughs) I'm just so, I can't believe you're like, it is now double digits. I am a grown-up and I will stay home and play Halo like a grown-up. It's just very impressive, the amount of restraint that you showed. I'm surprised next year you weren't like, never mind, I actually want to go back out. So I would love to hear, this is such a good question, and I hadn't even thought about this because in my head, I was just so stuck on the notion that like, you definitely trick or treat age birth through like eighth grade uh, or 14, that's like 13, 14 years old in the States. Um, And so you're right, though, there isn't an exact science to it. And I honestly, I, I just feel like, why do we have to stop? I, it just seems like it's something that is a fun community event for all ages. And people are like weirdly, like cruel about it. If you look too old, like I remember just being in eighth grade and going trick or treating with my friends and having grown-ups be like, don't you think you're too old for this? Like, don't you think you're too old to be like a nasty little witch about this? Come on, give me your fun size Snickers. Wouldn't that cost you $3? Jeez. 
So I would love to hear from other listeners, uh, you know, write in, call in, let us know when you stop trick-or-treating. I would love to hear if neighbors chastised you. Um, I know my mom would get very heated if teenagers, like the high school age teenagers came to our house. So if you did that, tell me about it. Let me know if you got chastised. Um, And then your second question about reusing a Halloween costume. It's so cute that you can see (laughs) yourself outgrowing the penguin costume. I was a bee, I believe, in uh, kindergarten and in first grade. And that was the only time that a full costume got reused. But in fourth grade, I was Vampira. And then I reused the black vampire gown to be one of the witches from Macbeth in seventh grade, which I uh, recently posted a picture of the Instagram where I forced my two best friends, both named Katie, to go as the witches of Macbeth with me trick-or-treating. And instead of saying trick-or-treat, I insisted that they say, that we all say together in unison, double, double, toil and trouble. (laughs) And the neighbors were baffled. So um, that really goes back to a couple of weeks ago, the Trick or Treat Map Small Frights episode where we had a caller asking about costumes that were obscure and how you deal with them. Uh, I have been trying to explain my costumes for at least since I was 12 or 13. <laughs> so those are the only times that I have reused costumes. Um, but I would, again, love to hear. I know I've heard stories from friends who went as the same thing like every year of their childhood. So please let us know. Also, Please send in your pictures of you as a kid in your costume and any more trick-or-treat stories over the next week. I would love to include more on uh, next week's episode because it'll be it'll be Halloween Eve for the next episode. So it'd be great to have some more trick-or-treat stories. Um, thank you so much for listening and for being a fan. I really appreciate this enthusiastic call and I love your advice to look at the moon every night and watch it get fuller or fuller since it will be a full moon on Halloween night it's a countdown I love it thank you so much okay next up we have a letter coming all the way from Transylvania OMG, Luce, me and my boyfriend love your podcast. You are summoning so much Halloween spirit back here in a country that doesn't celebrate it, but definitely should. So a bit of context, we live in Transylvania, north center of Romania, the home of the vampire myth, and... As we are listening to one of your Halloween Around the World episodes, I thought you might find this piece of folklore interesting. So the stories that inspired Bram Stoker's Dracula come from an old, morbid Romanian tradition that became illegal a few years ago. Here, the undead are called Strigoi, And the way to tell if your family is haunted by one of these creatures is if someone in the family died and the family members wake up in the morning drained of energy and the livestock is sick. The dead are thought to sometimes come back to haunt the living relatives, so people here used to practice unburying the departed to check if they are strigoi. They do this by looking for scratches on the coffin or if their hair and nails are growing. Of course, all of them showed signs of being strigoi slash vampires because after we're buried, our hair and fingernails seem to grow a little bit because our skin retracts and, well, we are getting smaller. But what the people here did was they would stab the heart of the deceased with something sharp or burn it and scatter the ashes or pull it out of the dead body's chest take it home, and make tea with it. The family of the deceased, starting with the youngest. Of course this tradition was banned as soon as Romania became a member of the European Union, and for good reason, or should I say reasons. But there were people that weren't too happy about this, 
Sometimes it feels like Transylvania is stuck in the Middle Ages, but with smartphones. I love living here, though, because of the mystery and the air and the beautiful nature. In closing, I've sent you a few pics from here and of our newest scarecrow my brother and I prepared for Halloween. The kids around here love it. To bring a bit of Halloween spirit to this village we're in, we're going to make a friendly scarecrow by the road equipped with a basket of candy so that the people here can join in the fun and also keep social distancing. Please keep up the amazing podcast. We can't wait for the next episode. Paul from Transylvania. P.S. Pardon the English I learned from TV. Paul, your English is fantastic. The story is top notch. Thank you so much. My heart sings knowing that I now have a friend in Transylvania. I have always wanted to come and visit. I love Bram Stoker's Dracula and um, the movie that uh, uh, Francis Ford Coppola made based on the novel. And I did not know all of these details about the Strigoi, even though I've, I've heard bits and pieces. So thank you so much. I actually just recently watched a short little three minute video from Animal Planet of all places about a murderer who people used to think was a Strigoi. And I will uh, put that in the show notes so that people can check it out. Like I said, it's just a three minute YouTube video. It's really interesting. There's some really cool pictures of like old illustrations of what people thought Strigoi might look like. Um, These pictures, Paul, that you shared of your scarecrow are magnificent. I'm going to put them on the Instagram because they are, it's so scary. You're so talented. It looks like a professional decoration at a haunted hayride here in Los Angeles. And thank you also for including a couple of cute pictures of gourds here. I haven't been able to go pick any gourds this season. So just seeing your pictures make me feel like I've had the experience myself. I'm so happy that you're enjoying the podcast and that you're bringing some safe Halloween traditions to your village. I hope I can come visit sometime. It sounds like a really beautiful, interesting place. I honestly can't get over that this was a recently banned (laughs) tradition, um, and I can't wait to look more into it. Um, Coming up in the future for It's Always Halloween, y'all might be curious since we're coming up on Halloween, what's going to come next? How are we going to keep this going? Well, I have, first of all, tons of plans, but more specifically, coming up in the new year, I want to do a whole series on creatures and monsters that are related to Halloween, and one of those monsters will be the vampire. So thank you, Paul, for getting me started with my research. I feel like I have a fun jumping off point with Strigoi, and look for that coming out in the new year. Okay, up next we have a call from a regular listener and contributor. This is Jenny, who has a a question for our listeners about Halloween food. Hi, it's Jenny calling. Um, Again, I called last week about um, the trick-or-treat short. And this week I was thinking about how part of my favorite Halloween traditions revolve around food. Um, And I wondered if, if others have a similar... Um, tradition. So for me as a kid, when we were done trick or treating, um, we always came home and my dad had a pot of his homemade chili waiting on the stove and that's what we ate. And it's just so delicious this time of year. Um, I don't really cook very much, but I do make my dad's chili um, at this time of year because it gives me that Halloween feeling and it just is nostalgic and it's delicious. Um, I also love pumpkin pie this time of year. I love apple cider donuts. I love going to farms and pumpkin patches and smelling them and then like biting into a hot, uh, steamy, delicious apple cider donut. Um, of course, I love apple cider. Um, now that I'm an adult, I also like to add pumpkin vodka or apple, or I'm sorry, or caramel vodka to apple cider. It's delicious. Um, So those are a few of my favorite Halloween season foods, and I wondered if others have foods that 
really help them get into the spirit of the season. Uh, thanks for the podcast. Bye-bye. Jenny, it's great to hear from you again. And this is such a good question because for me, the food that goes along with Halloween and the fall is just my favorite food. Nothing tastes better than fall food. And I love that you had a chili every time you came home from trick-or-treating that's so quaint and loving. What a great dad. I actually make a chili myself every fall that I'm pretty proud of. I'm vegan, mostly, and so I make a really solid vegan chili that I'm pretty obsessed with. And I also make a stuffed acorn squash that I really like. It's like Moroccan lentils and couscous and carrots. It's very good. Um, I'm happy to provide the recipes. I think it would be really fun to do some Halloween recipe sharing. I could post some up from listeners on the Instagram. Um, I do love apple cider donuts, too. I haven't... They're not really, if they're in LA, I have not been able to find them. It's something that I always get when I go back home to Ohio. Um, So this is fantastic. Please call in. Let us know your favorite foods. This time of year, I get nostalgic for food also. I think that's an interesting an interesting experience that I don't think about too often because I don't come from a family of cooks. We did a lot of fast food and, uh, you know, my parents would cook sometimes, but like, it's not like there's a famous spaghetti or something that I long for. Uh, so I'm really nostalgic for foods that I would get at the orchards that were near my hometown when I was a kid. So let us know, listeners, what fall foods are you loving right now? Up next, we have a letter from Shannon. Hi, Luce. I hope you're enjoying high spooky season. One of my favorite Halloween memories dates back to elementary school in St. Louis, Missouri. Every year for Halloween, my music teacher would sit all the kids on the floor in the middle of the room, haul out the overhead projector, dim the lights, and play for us dance macabre. While orchestral music played from a tape, the teacher switched images on the overhead projector at the exact right time to tell the story. The slideshow is about death. At midnight, every year on Halloween, death plays its song in a graveyard. The dead, depicted as skeletons, rise for a night of dancing and merriment until they must return to their graves again at dawn. I love this piece, and I make sure to watch it every year for Halloween. I find the art hauntingly beautiful, and just hearing the music gets me into the Halloween spirit. Thankfully, YouTube has my back, and I'm able to watch it without having to access the physical slides. Have you ever seen this? Did you watch it on an outdated overhead projector? If not, where did you come across it? I appreciate all the love and effort you're putting into this podcast. You're definitely helping me do all I can to enjoy Halloween this year. Love, Shannon. P.S. Links to the slideshow and music on YouTube are attached. Shannon, thank you so much. This is very cool. I have never seen this slideshow. This wasn't a part of my childhood experience, but I watched it um, after you emailed it to me, and I found it like low-key frightening, like very haunting. The imagery reminded me of a German expressionist film. I enjoy it quite a bit. Thank you. I'm going to put the links in the show notes so that the listeners can watch, and then I'll put it up on our Instagram page at It's Always Halloween Podcast for people to see there as well. I would love to hear from anybody if they've had this experience. Um... In my music class in elementary school every year, our music teacher, Mrs. Palnick, used to play a game called the Purple Banshee, and we all had to put our heads down, uh, like heads up, seven up, we had to look down at our desks, and she would put on this like eerie purple monster mask, and she would go around and tap a few kids on the shoulder, And if she tapped you, you could look at her. 
and then you had to draw her and then the best version of who drew the purple banshee won i believe this is uh heavily you know uh, lots of things have happened to me since then so this memory has a few holes in it for sure um but a good friend of mine from childhood emily won the purple banshee contest and she found her certificate recently so Maybe Emily can tell us a little bit more about that memory if she has it. I'd love to hear what other people did in their music classrooms, and I look forward to sharing Dance Macabre with everybody because it is bizarre and beautiful, and I love it. Thank you so much, Shannon. Hey, hi. uh, This is Mike calling from uh, the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. Hey, I was thinking I wanted to share this. My wife and I, since um, we really big music fans, we love all kinds of music. So back in 2008, during the Halloween season, we said, why don't we make our own Halloween playlist? So every year since then, we've been making a Halloween playlist of our own and, and been keeping them. So every season now, we pull them out and we play, play the music. And we spend all year long now tracking down songs to put on a Halloween playlist. So it might be a fun thing if people are wondering what to do during quarantine, put your own playlist together. Happy Halloween. Heck yes, Mike. That is such good advice. I do the same thing. I actually made a Halloween playlist this year that is much shorter than the ones I normally make. It was like a little more intentional. Um, And it's on Spotify. So I'll drop mine in the show notes. And Mike, if you want to share your playlist, if it's public at all, please feel free to send it in. And I'll share it with the listeners. If anybody else has a Halloween playlist out there that they want to share with us, please send it along. I can never get enough Halloween music. Not to sound like a total cliche, but it is what I listen to when I am working on the podcast. (laughs) Definitely puts me in the mood. And it's such a great way to have your own little dance party, even if you can't be with a whole group of friends. So awesome call, Mike. I love Vermont. I got to go there one time two years ago. It was so beautiful. So thank you for welcoming me to your kingdom. (laughs) And I can't wait to come back. All right. Up next, we have a letter. And it's another letter in regards to the real life dead bodies being possibly a part of Halloween decorations. So if this is too much for sensitive listeners, this is your opportunity to skip over this letter. Otherwise, here we go. Hi, Luce. I was listening to your Small Frights episode, Trick or Treat Map, and I had to write back in regards to a listener call. In the call, they mentioned a possible real-life hanging in a haunted hayride. I had to send you this wild and sad instance of a real person, Elmer McCurdy, being used in a haunted attraction after death. Like you said, if this happened in the 2000s, it most likely happened before. But this story really shocked me with how much it happened after this man's passing. There's a really good dollop podcast episode for it. Episode 69. Nice. Thanks for keeping the Halloween vibes going all year round and being so wonderful. Hugs, Yael. And then Yale linked the article from Slate.com, and I'm just going to read it to you because it's a pretty short one. How a real corpse ended up in a California fun park spook house. It was 1976. Crew members from the TV show The Six Million Dollar Man were preparing to shoot on location at the Pike Amusement Park in Long Beach, California. The plan was to capture Steve Austin, the titular pricey fellow, riding in one of the cars along the track of a spooky ride called Laugh in the Dark. The ride featured a tunnel in which ghouls, demons, and skeletons would pop up and scare you as your car jolted from side to side in the dark. While sprucing up the set, a $6 million man employee spotted a mannequin hanging from a noose in the corner. He reached for the mannequin's arm, and the arm broke off in his hand. Looking at the dismembered limb, 
The worker was astonished to see what looked like bone beneath layers of desiccated skin. This was no mannequin. This was a man. The hanging corpse in question was once Elmer McCurdy, an outlaw who died in a gunfight with police 65 years before being found in the funhouse. In 1911, the mischief-making vagabond robbed a train near Oseka, Oklahoma, then took his spoils, $46 and two jugs of whiskey, north where he holed up in a barnyard on the Kansas border. Police pursued him and ended up killing him in a shootout amongst the hay. McCurdy's body was taken to a funeral home in Paw Huska, but no one claimed it. Seeing a money-making opportunity, the undertaker embalmed him and allowed visitors to view the preserved corpse if they placed a nickel in its mouth. Ooh. Five years into this lucrative scheme, a carnival man turned up at the funeral home claiming to be a long-lost relative of McCurdy, and he requested to take the body so it could be laid to rest properly. He was, of course, lying through his teeth. Within weeks, the McCurdy corpse was the star attraction of a traveling carnival. For 60 years, McCurdy's mummy made the rounds at carnivals, wax museums, haunted houses, until eventually it turned up inexplicably at the Pike in Long Beach. By this time, the legend of the outlaw McCurdy was long forgotten, and the body was assumed to be a fake. After the $6 million man discovery, the police identified McCurdy and sent the body to Summit View Cemetery in Guthrie, Oklahoma, for its long-delayed internment. McCurdy's grave is marked by a stone that lists his death date as 1911 and burial date as 1977, with no elaboration on the matter. A thick layer of concrete atop the casket ensures that the corpse won't go on a walkabout again. Wow. Absolutely wild. Thank you so much for sending in the story, Yale. I love The Dollop. It's one of my favorite podcasts. It's a comedy history podcast that I highly recommend. And I remember this episode, but I totally forgot all about it. It was not in my long-term memory bank. And I really love this article. I'm going to post this in the show notes. And uh, this is by Ella Morton, How a Real Life Corpse Ended Up in a California Fun Park Spook House. And, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time on the Pike at Long Beach. It's not too far from where I live. And it's just so wild that that happened there. Um, what a great place if you're in the Southern California area to maybe go visit, even though the Fun House isn't there anymore. You can you know, skip along the area the, where it used to be. It's probably an H&M now, but still a haunted H&M. All right. Well, there's no more room left on the All Hallows Hotline tape, and we've scraped the bottom of the eek mail bag. So that is it for today's Small Fright episode. I do just want to tell you a couple of things before I go. On the most recent history episode, tr the history of Trick or Treat, I talked about how um, Charles Schultz, the, uh, the writer for the Peanuts comic strip, introduced the phrase Trick or Treat nationally when he um, wrote a comic about it that was published in, uh, on November 1st, 1951. And so to me, uh, it's the great pumpkin Charlie Brown is one of those Halloween specials I have to see every year gives me that warm, fuzzy feeling. And I saw an article in the Los Angeles Times today that said that the Charlie Brown TV specials weren't going to be in the on ABC for like the first time. Um, it's going to be streaming exclusively on Apple TV, which I thought was really interesting. Um, the Los Angeles Times says that doesn't mean Peanuts fans will completely miss out on their traditional viewing of the beloved 1960s programs. The Halloween special is already available, but will be streamed for free on the Apple TV Plus app from October 30th to November 1st. Likewise, the Thanksgiving special will stream for subscribers, but then offered for free, and then the same with the Christmas special. So, um... Yeah, I 
I'm sort of flabbergasted, but it makes sense. I'm sure families aren't watching network TV the way that I did in the 90s. So uh, I'll include that article so you guys can know how to find It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. And then I have a fun recommendation for you as well. My friend Josh Schaefer, who is the co-founder of Lunch Meat VHS, which is a really cool website dedicated to the appreciation, celebration, and preservation of VHS culture, uh, he has a really great YouTube channel where he calls old, uh, bizarre, oddball, hard-to-find VHS tapes, and he has a really great special up there now called The Happy Haunting of America. America. And it's a VHS horror holiday documentary from 1997. And it's about an hour long. And I had such a, like, it was so fun watching it. It's, you know, a little cheesy, but it's got really great camp value. And there were many things in it I actually did not know about. And I learned some really interesting facts. Um, and I think what you'll enjoy too, as regular listeners to It's Always Halloween, is people are just spouting off facts that are half truths and like kind of misnomers about the history of Halloween. And I thought it was so interesting to watch now, you know, 23 years later. And I kept being like, um, excuse me, sir, that is actually not correct. But I mean, who knows what these people are up to now? Um, so, you know, don't treat it like a, a very deeply researched documentary, but I think you can have a lot of fun with it. And I'm going to put that in the show notes as well. All right, listeners, if you have a story, memory, a question that you want to share, please call into the All Hallows hotline. It's 802-532-DEAD. Or you can write us an email at it's always Halloween podcast at gmail.com. I'd love to feature your stories and memories on an upcoming Small Frights Friday episode. You can also reach out on our new Instagram page at It's Always Halloween Podcast. There you'll find all kinds of recommendations as well as all the visuals that correspond to each episode. In addition, we now have a Patreon. And I will be building out a ton of extra content there as well. I'm going to be recording ghost stories and I'm going to be doing a movie night twice a month where we can basically all stream and watch a movie together. And I will talk about the horror and Halloween related history of that film going into it. So follow us on Patreon at patreon.com slash it's always Halloween. And now you can find It's Always Halloween on the NPR One app where you can uh, stream and download all of our episodes there alongside some of my favorite podcasts like Fresh Air and This American Life and Invisibilia. This is such an exciting development for us. I still can hardly believe it. So check us out at NPR One. It's Always Halloween is researched, written, and performed by me, Luce Tomlin Brenner. The editing, the music, and sound design is by Pete Burns. Thanks, Pete. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at LTB Comedy and Pete at Mittenberries. If you're on Apple Podcasts, please subscribe and write us a little review so that other like-minded ghouls can find us. I want everyone to know I've been reading the reviews and taking in all of the suggestions and thoughts and concerns, and I really appreciate your feedback. Thanks so much for listening to It's Always Halloween, and come back next time, unless you're too scared.